Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association. Making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. And New Jersey Realtors, the voice of real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. Tonight on NJ Spotlight News, with six days to go, Democrat Andy Kim has a sizable lead in the latest poll over Republican Curtis Bashaw on the race for U.S. Senate, as lawmakers in Trenton debate what a new ballot could look like. There is definitely more than one way to design a ballot and still give voters an easy way to select the candidates that they most prefer. Plus, pouring millions into New Jersey ports, the Biden administration is looking to make our freight line more climate friendly. Today, it's about reducing carbon emissions while building resiliency. It's about protecting our environment without sacrificing the efficiency and economic impact of our port. And it means creating countless good paying jobs. Also increasing cannabis fees as the industry continues to cash in, the Regulatory Commission is looking for more money to support social equity. That money is specifically earmarked to go back to communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs, folks that have been traditionally disenfranchised. And one South Brunswick mom's mission to end cyberbullying. Social media is not going anywhere, but we need to make it safer for these kids to navigate because right now it is a free for all. And you know, it, they just cannot navigate it by themselves. NJ Spotlight News begins right now. From NJ PBS Studios, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venozzi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Wednesday night. I'm Brianna Venozzi. We begin with a few key stories we're following. First, no toss up here in New Jersey. Voters are true blue to Democrats. A Rutgers Eagleton poll out today finds registered voters in the Garden State are more likely to vote for Democrats up and down the ballot between now and November 5th. It also shows Democratic candidates hold a double digit lead over GOP candidates. 55% of voters here say they're going for vice president. President Kamala Harris, just 35 percent said they'd vote for former President Donald Trump. Now, U.S. Senate candidate Andy Kim also holds a sizable lead against Republican Curtis Bashaw, according to the poll, 49 to 26 percent, with a whopping 19 percent of respondents who still don't know who they'll vote for in that race. Eagleton director Ashley Koning says voters' lack of awareness of the Senate candidates is what makes party affiliation so important. This has been perhaps one of the most unorthodox races we've seen in a long time in terms of going from a heightened level of drama as of this time a year ago to something that we really haven't been dedicating much time or information to as voters, as the public simply because the race seems at this point like a done deal. And that's not the only poll favoring Democrats. A Fairleigh Dickinson University survey released today is in line with those results, showing Democrat Andy Kim leading Bashaw by 18 points among likely voters in New Jersey, 59 to 39 percent. More evidence that Kim is likely to become the state's next U.S. senator. Also tonight, New Jersey Transit says these new rail cars will improve your commute. The struggling transportation agency today previewed the first of 174 new multi-level rail cars, which will replace many of the oldest single-level cars at the agency and hopefully reduce the odds that your train will get stuck or delayed. The electric self-propelled rail cars are the first of their kind in North America and touted as having higher reliability. They also come with all kinds of gadgets and amenities like USB charging ports and onboard information screens. The new rail cars are expected to start operating by the middle of next year and, according to New Jersey Transit officials, were purchased with the help of more than half a billion dollars in federal funds. It comes after commuters experienced a so-called summer of hell filled with abrupt delays and cancellations. According to federal data, during the first five months of 2024, there were 550 New Jersey Transit trains canceled due to mechanical failures. Well, Governor Murphy today said the new cars will make those frustrating rides fewer and farther apart. NJ Transit is not perfect. Let's all stick. None of us are. 
But this is an example of the progress that we have made that has been overwhelming. And I promise to the commuters and customers out there, we will stay at it and sprint through the tape over the last 15 or so months of our administration. And a controversial bill that would make it harder to ban books in New Jersey is now sitting on Governor Murphy's desk awaiting a signature. This after clearing the final hurdle this week, gaining state Senate approval. Sponsors say the bill is designed to limit book bans in public schools and prevent librarians from being sued over the material on shelves. The Freedom to Read Act would require the state education commissioner to come up with policies on how library materials are selected and how challenges challenges to those books are considered. The responsibility would then be on local school and library boards to adopt their own guidelines using that model. The action comes after the number of books targeted for removal nationally skyrocketed some 65 percent, according to the American Library Association, mainly for including LGBTQ plus or sexually explicit content. But also, as a growing number of librarians say, they faced harassment from parents over book removal demands. The bill gives librarians and library staff more legal protections from civil and criminal lawsuits. It faced fierce opposition from Republicans. Republican members of the legislature who argued the books put kids at risk by exposing them to inappropriate material. Well, another county clerk has agreed to settle a lawsuit over the so-called party line ballot system used in New Jersey. Monmouth County, which was the first defendant named in the federal lawsuit challenging the ballot design, will drop its defense of the ballot and is agreeing to use office block ballots in future primary elections. Clerk Christine Hanlon said after the attorney general declined to continue defending the line, it didn't make financial sense to continue battling it in court. It comes as a number of other county clerks and political chairs have settled their suits and as a new select committee in the assembly kicked off a series of hearings to determine what a new ballot could potentially look like. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Certainly fairness should apply to every election held in our state. For the brand new Assembly Select Committee, it's all about drawing up a fairer ballot for New Jersey voters, one that erases the advantage Jersey's political bosses historically wielded by stacking preferred candidates in the old county line ballot. Lawmakers called in an expert from Colorado for advice. There is definitely more than one way to design a ballot and still give voters an easy way to select the candidates that they most prefer. Wendy Underhill explained other states use some form of office block style ballots or random drawings, giving every candidate a fair shot at a decent spot. She noted lawmakers have several choices. And systems that, uh, there are more than one system that leads to winners and losers based on those voters' choices. And that's what an election, of course, is all about. So New Jersey is really on its own thinking this through sort of from, from scratch. Actually, New Jersey got here following a grassroots revolt against the county line ballot and multiple lawsuits. One filed by Democratic Senate candidate Andy Kim, who sat in on the committee hearing, ended with Judge Zahid Qureshi's order for county clerks to switch and use office block ballots in the recent Democratic primary. Essex County's Eliana Pintor-Marin said her voters found the change tough to follow. English is not a first language. Uh, so we had an example of what the office block looked like um, in the past election. Um, and it was like people were confused, right? But Essex County Clerk Chris Durkin considered the new ballot switch a, quote, positive experience. But overall, I thought uh, the voter uh, handled the change, uh, understood uh, the block ballot voting, uh, and... Uh, you know, overall, I think it was pretty seamless. Other county clerks described a backlash from angry voters. There's been a lot changing in elections over the last few years. And while each individual piece of policy I know was meant to enfranchise voters, bring more people to the table, uh, it's sown a lot of distrust and a lot of confusion. When you make a change, let's do it properly. Let's do it right. Let's do it with education. I don't have a problem with office block uh, style. A panel of six election officials, some from counties still involved in settling legal ballot disputes, said some of their voters wanted candidates grouped together. Voters will vote for who they know, and they look for 
those clues to see if they're uh, candidates that have their same values and whether that's Republican, Democrat. You know, on a local level, the local candidates want to be with, they want to be, they want to be in a club, they want to be together. And, you know, they seek that grouping through the county committees and through the county, county conventions. It really boils down to one thing, which is, you know, everyone should be treated the same on the ballot. No one should be given any advantage. You know, some of the question lines were saying, you know, can some of the assembly candidates be positioned together? I mean, you know, that concerns me. The committee says Kim will receive an invitation to testify. So far, the assemblies launched this ballot design project without input from colleagues in the Senate. New Jersey Working Families, which also filed ballot lawsuits, wants full engagement. It was sort of not quite starting out on the right foot to not have at least some form of public testimony being given here today and to start with an invitation only hearing. The committee will meet several more times to get more input. What's their deadline? Well, one county clerk told them she's got to start putting a ballot together by March 24th. At the State House in Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. And make sure you keep it right here for NJ Decides 2024 election night coverage. We're live starting at 8 p.m. with all the results. Reporters fanned across the state at campaign headquarters and in-studio political analysis with Ryder University's Micah Rasmussen and many others. That's next Tuesday, November 5th, right here on NJPBS, also streaming on our YouTube channel and on our digital site until the last race is called. On the heels of a port strike that nearly crippled the nation's supply chain, federal and state leaders today gathered at the Port of Newark, this time, though, for a less contentious announcement. Nearly $400 million awarded by the Environmental Protection Agency to electrify the port's cargo equipment and trucks. Also, to reduce the number of polluting vehicles that roll in and out of the port on a daily basis. It's part of a $3 billion pot of money President Biden announced on Tuesday at a port in Baltimore as the administration looks to clean up the environmental impact of the nation's freight line. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas has that story. We are so happy to announce the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to receive $344 million and C Street Ferry Company to receive over $54 million. Federal, state, and local leaders gathered at Port Newark today to celebrate nearly $400 million coming from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Clean Ports Program to help clean and green the activity around the ports in Newark, Elizabeth, and Bayonne. Today, it's about reducing carbon emissions while building resiliency. It's about protecting our environment without sacrificing the efficiency and economic impact of our port, and it means creating countless good paying jobs. The grant is part of a total $3 billion announced today for clean ports programs around the country, that funding coming from the Inflation Reduction Act. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey had to apply for the grant that they say will cut some 67,000 tons of carbon dioxide. They weren't the only winners in New Jersey. $540 million was also awarded to the Delaware River and Bay authorities for the Cape May Lewis Ferry Terminals. I applaud the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for its commitments to environmental justice and the fight against climate change. And this funding will advance the shared goals of increasing air quality and emissions reductions at the port. The funding breaks down into three major buckets, $344 million to electrify port operations, 54 million to the C Street Ferry Company and 3 million from the Climate Air Quality Planning Program that'll create a community advisory committee to give local residents input on the plans. Port Authority Director Beth Ann Rooney explains how the 344 million will be spent on four major programs in and around the port. One to help replace cargo handling equipment, which is all the specialized machinery uh, that is used in the container terminals to move the containers on and off the ships, on and off of trains, and on and off of trucks. Uh, the second component will be used to allow ships to plug in when they arrive here at the port so that they're not continuing to burn their diesel engines while they're, uh, they're sitting here for 24, 36, 48 hours at a time. Third will be a voucher incentive program to help truck drivers upgrade their trucks to a zero emission capability. All of that funding will be supported by basic uh, infrastructure, so upgrading the electric uh, grid to support that. 
And then the fourth component is workforce development and workforce training so that the workforce uh, here at the port, uh, both in the terminals and with the trucking community, know how to operate and maintain uh, the new equipment. Bruni gives it six to nine months before any of the new zero emission equipment makes it to the port. As for the Sea Streak Ferry, $54 million will go to upgrading the fleet to zero emission ferries. In New York and New Jersey, people take the ferries back and forth, and so it's a real win win-win, as I said, to reduce climate pollution, reduce air pollution. A major driver of this work came from environmental justice organizations advocating for cleaner air and less pollution in those communities adjacent to the port that they say bear the brunt of the pollution from port activity, while the rest of the region only enjoys the economic gains. As a mother of three asthmatic children living in a community the south ward of Newark, which we refer to as the diesel, diesel death zone. Now today I can say that that is going to change with this funding and the collaboration and support that we're receiving. We can lift the GDP, create jobs, uh, you know, fund our economy, uh, grow opportunity, and at the same time make sure uh, that the social determinants of health that affect the lives of our kids every single day are solid or good or allowing them to live longer lives. It's going to take some time to get these programs underway and some of them will be refined through the input of the Community Advisory Board but in the end reducing 67,000 tons of carbon dioxide will have a massive impact on this region. At Port Newark, I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. In our Spotlight on Business report, will the state raise taxes on cannabis? Advocates and members of New Jersey's Cannabis Regulatory Commission are debating whether to increase what's known as the social equity excise fee. It's a tax on every ounce of recreational cannabis sold with the money steered toward social equity projects in neighborhoods most affected by the war on drugs. With the industry booming, progressive groups say the time is now to raise more money for that mission, while others argue a high higher tax will hurt the market. Ted Goldberg has the details. I think it behooves us to get this right. The Cannabis Regulatory Commission is taking a smoke break on raising the social equity excise fee, or SEEF, charged on each ounce of cannabis. I think this will afford the commission more time to gather more information, to speak to more stakeholders and organizations who represent the businesses, and the people who will be directly impacted by this decision. The CRC had considered raising the CEF from a buck 24 per ounce to $30 per ounce during a virtual meeting Wednesday, but they say they'll mull it over a bit longer. That money is specifically earmarked to go back to communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs, folks that have been traditionally disenfranchised. The CEF has changed each year that cannabis has been sold in New Jersey, and it's raised about five and a half million dollars so far. By law, 15% of that money is dedicated to underage deterrence, while the rest is allocated by statewide and local leaders. Let's say your community needs after school programming. That money could be used to fund that, or maybe a scholarship fund, or maybe that money could be used for grant programs for minority-owned businesses that might need additional additional reinvestment. This is necessary to ensure the investments are so desperately that are desperately needed to repair and restore impacted communities are done in a meaningful and substantive way. This is a very targeted fee on cultivators, which tend to be, as far as industry goes, larger and wealthier parts of that industry. And New Jersey is actually one of the lowest taxed cannabis industries in the country right now. Advocates say the SEAF needs to be raised to help communities adversely affected by the war on drugs. At the time, the SEAF was set purposefully low in order to allow the new industry to grow, with a promise that a higher fee would be implemented in the future to meet the need for meaningful community reinvestment. My hope is that um, when a, you know the final decision is made, that we will not be leaving millions of dollars on the table that should be invested back into Black and Latinx communities that have borne the brunt of the drug war. Others argue that cannabis in New Jersey is already too expensive and that raising the SEAF would aggravate customers and make it harder for people trying to break into the industry. You can't kill this golden goose right now because this tax, this thief tax at the $30 rate would decimate the racial and social equity that you've built. And what it would do is absolutely exacerbate the problems of the legacy market. One of the greatest successes that New Jersey has had. The fund is great. 
um, well intended. I can understand certainly a modest increase if you went from a dollar twenty four to two fifty or even five dollars. The feeling back to the consumer would be negligible. But to go to a twenty three hundred percent increase right now is the absolute wrong time. Even the CRC concedes that small businesses could face obstacles that would be easier for big business. I'm concerned for all of our businesses, but our small businesses, our businesses that are just onboarding, our new cultivators, um, this decision can be devastating. And what we've already heard um, from businesses, access to capital is so hard to come by. The CEF is predicted to bring in about $2.5 million over fiscal year 2024, with possibly much more money raised in the future off the backs of buyers and sellers in New Jersey's cannabis market. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Ted Goldberg. Finally tonight, one South Brunswick mom's personal fight to end cyberbullying. Erin Popolo has spent the last three years meeting with elected leaders, traveling to D.C., and advocating for children like her daughter Emily, who died by suicide in 2021 at the age of 16 after relentless bullying from peers who took to social media to target her. Erin's mission is to prevent other kids from the same online harms, working tirelessly alongside other parents in getting Congress to pass the kids' Online Safety Act, or COSA, which advocates say would give families the tools and safeguards they need to protect against threats to kids' health and well-being online. Aaron Popolo is with me now in the studio to share more. Aaron, I'm so happy to get a chance to sit down with you. Since that time, you've created Emmys Champions, a foundation, a nonprofit, created yes. a kindness fair. You've met with uh, folks in D.C. Is it the advocacy work that keeps you going? Yes, <laughs> um, it that it's helps ch channel my grief into being something productive. Um, otherwise, I could kind of at the beginning after Emily died, I was a bit a big advocate for her to begin with because she was a special education student. So my my advocacy was part of my identity. So even at, so, when Emily died, I kind of lost that whole part of my identity and. I needed something to channel my grief because I could just, it was like, you, you literally, it's, your life gets shattered. I mean, and you've met countless other families and parents at this point who have lived a very similar experience. Yes, yes. And it's, it's crazy, but there, it, there's a whole underworld of, of bereaved parents that no one ever hears about. Um, and we all seem to find each other. <laughs> so when you meet with folks, let's say in D.C., Congress members, and you're talking about this online safety act, I mean, of course, there's been a lot more attention on this and on these tech companies in the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, what's the message that you give them? Well, essentially, the, the parents that I travel to D.C. with, we all um, have lost a child to something related to social media. So Emily was cyberbullied. Um, I know parents who their children have died by um, a, taking a, a cha you know, a social media challenge or, you know, picking up drugs that were laced with fent fentanyl through Snapchat or Instagram. So um, we all have been, our children have been ha harmed by something online. And so we are focusing on making social media, social media is not going anywhere but we need to make it safer for these kids to navigate because right now it is a free for all. And you know, it, they just cannot navigate it by themselves. Um, we really want the, the, um, the social media companies to be a little bit more res you know, responsible for what's being uh, put up on their platform. Right now, the, the COSA Act, it's been passed in the Senate. Yes. It has not yet been posted for a full vote in the House, although it no. made it through Frank Pallone's uh, committee for markups. It did. What do you want to say to those lawmakers who are not posting this bill? Um, Honestly, I want to say that, you know, if it was their child that had been harmed, I'm sure it would have been out for a full, full you know, for a floor vote already. But it's not because I, you know, there's, you know, tech has spent $51 million just this year in lobbying against us. I mean, we're 20 parents who go to D.C., you know, and, you know, we talk to law lawmakers and tell them our horrific stories. 
and these tech companies are coming in with all this money behind them. We, you know, it's we're it's hard to fight that. You know, it's really it's not about red or blue. It is about you know the kids. This is about keeping our children safe. I already paid the ultimate price for putting my child on social media. You know, I don't want anyone else to have to walk this sh this path because it's terrible. It you know, it is life shattering. It alters your entire life. And I don't, you know, you have a young child. I don't want you to have to worry about this 10 years from now. I want there to be things in place so that, you know, when you get there, that this is something that is, you know, in, that, you know, is manageable for these kids. Uh, Aaron, thank you for sharing your story um, and, of course, for keeping Emily's memory alive in the advocacy work that you're doing. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's going to do it for us tonight. But before we go, if you want to get to know the candidates running in your district, check out our NJ Decides 2024 Election Exchange podcast, where David Cruz, Colleen O'Day, and I go one-on-one -on -one with the candidates running for the 12 congressional seats up for grabs and the only U.S. Senate seat on the ballot here in New Jersey. You can download the entire series wherever you listen and hear why they think they deserve your vote. I'm Brianna Venozzi. For the entire team at NJ Spotlight News, thanks for being with us. Have a great night. We'll see you right back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years and by the PSCG Foundation.